Okay, well, hello, everyone. We've had some really interesting talks, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary, to Usha, and also to Emma for all their remarks. Um, by my reckoning, we're 30 minutes behind schedule, but I guess we've still got half an hour for our panel. So um, I'm just going to do a very little introduction on something called the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure. And uh, whilst I'm talking, just to save time, Tony, why don't you come and sit here, our panelists, and... Uh, uh, Christina, where are you? Are you here, Christina? Mm -hmm. If you come and sit here and have it on the end, and then uh, I'd leave this seat free, because that's probably... Well, maybe I'll stay here, I don't know. So, look, um, some thoughts. Uh, Forty years ago, I was running around the forests of Borneo as a zoologist. If I look back now, it's like a bombsite. When I was there, it was pristine. I could go to the highest mountains and look out over a sea of green. Today, it's still a sea of green. But none of it is rainforest. It's all palm oil. And you sort of look at how are those changes happening, uh, and you ask yourself <coughs> questions if you've been on this journey like I have for 40 years, and you move through some interesting lands. One of them is called Bil uh, Trilo, sorry, Milonia. That's where most NGOs are. We think a million dollars is a lot of money. Then you go to Bilonia, which is where governments are, and they think that's a lot of money. But really where the big country is is Trilonia which is where the big finance houses are all working. And, um, and other statistics, we spend about 150 billion a year trying to protect nature around the world. But the subsidies that harm nature, just subsidies, is five times that. So if we doubled all the money governments were spending to protect nature, it wouldn't even come close to just the subsidies that harm nature. If you then add in private sector money that either directly or in indirectly and inadvertently often is also harming nature, the ratio is about 100 to 1. We can't win any of the things we're talking about unless we start to engage in the land of Trelonia. And that's the purpose, ultimately, of what the Task Force on Nature-Related Finance is trying to do. Um, my name, so I haven't introduced myself. My name's Andrew Mitchell. I'm the Vice Chair of the uh, Stewardship Council of the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, which is basically the people who thought it up and the people who are paying for it, uh, which include Global Canopy, and Nikki is somewhere here, I expect, you're going to hear from him later, Global Canopy, which is a think tank that I started 20 years ago in Oxford, uh, UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, World Wildlife Fund, uh, and also the uh, UNEPFI. And we kind of had this idea, if you look, go back to 2015, a couple of things really changed the thinking in, Milonia, in Trelonia. And it was the Paris Agreement, oh my God, 200 governments actually agreed on something. There might be some stranded assets that we have to worry about. The second thing that happened was we need a framework to understand what we're getting into on climate change because we don't really know how to deal with this. And that was Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg who came up with the task force on climate-related financial disclosure. So we all thought, well, couldn't we play the same trick but with nature? Because we have to go beyond carbon. That's just the first step. And the thing we hear from most people, whether it's Treasury or the captains of, uh, of Trelonia, they say, ah, you know, we're doing, busy doing climate now. Can't nature wait? Uh, well, it can't. And one of the best examples of that is why we're all wearing masks. It's called COVID-19, a tiny speck of nature-related risk that nobody thought was there in their portfolios or in our world. It's turned all our lives upside down. It's turned all our economies upside down. It's cost around about $27 trillion to try and fix and propping up economies. Does anybody think nature-related risk is small? If they are, they're blind. So, but we don't have a framework for dealing with that because the origins of things like these pandemics is due to environmental degradation. It's not a health problem, it's an environmental problem. And so we have to really get real about dealing with that. So if you think you're really good, oh, we're doing climate, well done. We're doing ESG, no you're not, it's CSG. It's all about carbon. We've got to step in that journey a little bit further along that journey and take in water, forests, landscapes, oceans. This is all what we need to do. So this new framework, the TNFD, is our attempt to try and come up with a framework that will deal with all that stuff beyond carbon. It's not going to be easy, as you will hear in our panel, and, uh, but it's super exciting because it's after climate, nature's next. So uh, on our panel today, I'm going to introduce you to Tony, Tony Goldner, who is the executive director of TNFD, only recently appointed this year. Uh, we have Christina from Greek Seafoods. Uh, who is going to tell us a corporate perspective, but from the idea of from oceans and ocean farming. And Abid Kamali, uh, who is from Bank of America, who will give us 
the perspective from Trilonia. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. You can speak from there, Tony, if you wish, or come up here right. to give us five minutes on what is the TNFD. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew, it's, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I was just sitting in that chair looking out the window thinking this is much better than a fake Zoom background with a, with a, with a natural landscape. So if you're staring past me looking at the golf, that's uh, perfectly fine. Um, so just to build on Andrew's comments, uh, I thought before I explain sort of who we are and how we're organised, it might be helpful to articulate the why about the TNFD. And I think the first point that I'd make is uh, you know, this COP, talk about nature is everywhere. And so I think it's less now an issue of is nature-related risk disclosure coming, but more about when. I think we've now crossed a in very important threshold. And so for corporate leaders, for investment managers, uh, this needs to be firmly on the agenda because it's very clear that this is, this is coming and it's coming quite soon. And uh, I think that's really the... The reason why we've come, come into being is to figure out how to provide that construct to inform those decisions. So um, that, that's the first point I'd make. And I think the minister and, 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 uh, and uh, a colleague from UNDP, who, as Andrew said, is one of our founding partners, have made the point that climate and nature are two sides of the same coin. Uh, so as we start to move the discussion and broaden the aperture away from the C into a much broader uh, discussion around the E and the other components of the E, um, uh, we need a construct and a way to start thinking about risk uh, and before we get to risk about impacts and dependencies on nature because we can't get to risks and opportunities if we haven't figured out and understood what the impacts and the dependencies are. And the, reason, the other reason I would say about why, why this is coming and coming soon is we have garnered in very short short succession, uh, fairly powerful endorsements from the G7, from the G20, uh, even in the NGFS uh, and Finance Minister's statement yesterday, uh, while we weren't named, there was a very clear paragraph uh, basically outlining the purpose and the mission of, of the TNFD um, and driving towards nature positive outcomes. So we, we are now, uh, you know, in an environment with very, very strong signals of political support around the, the agenda that we're now embarking on. So again, I think it's a matter of, of uh, when, not a matter of if. The second point I'd make is, uh, this is complicated. Uh, we don't have a construct to work with on this agenda of 1.5, we don't have, you know, tar motivating targets of 1.5 or 2 degrees. Uh, we don't have a construct of scope emissions. Uh, we don't have a, a, a motivating strategy of net zero. We have to construct all of this for the nature agenda, and that's going to be part of our work. And those things are powerful not just as an organising principle, but also as a communication tool. You know, we, we now live in a world where corporate executives are everywhere are talking about net zero. I, I don't think there's a unified uh, de uh, definition of, of net zero. But that language system is very important as a motivating and, uh, and, a, and a participation vehicle for change. But we have to create that for nature. So at the same time, that's going to be complicated, but we don't want it to be overwhelming. So our real challenge as a task force is doing something at one, at one level which is quite straightforward, building a framework for risk management and disclosure, but on the other hand, quite complicated, which is to take all of the complexity of nature and, and make that an accessible uh, and scalable platform for participation. Because we can come up with a very elegant and sophisticated scientifically based framework, but if at the end of the day it's too complicated and nobody uses it, we still will have failed in our mission. So we have to achieve these two goals of, of building a framework and building the foundations for market adoption. Those two things have to, we have to achieve both of them if we're going to succeed in our ult ultimate mission. Um, and so that gets to the third point, which is we have to take, and the minister made this point, we have to take a collaborative approach to building a framework around uh, nature-related risk and around nat natural capital opportunities. And so by design, the task force is, is incredibly collaborative. We have um, the support of governments in the stakeholder group that Andrew is now, uh, is now chairing. Uh, we have a number of governments participating there. We have U UNDP and UNEPFI. Uh, amongst others. We've got uh, the conservation groups and scientific bodies participating in what we're calling the Knowledge Hub, uh, and they will be critical partners for us in building the framework. Um, 
and the task force is is only represented by by the private sector. We don't have government sitting on the task force. So we have 35 members on the task force, and they are companies, market intermediaries, and financial institutions. Uh, Abbott and Christina being being two of our task force members. So we will only succeed in building something that is both uh, uh, scientifically grounded, science-based, and market relevant if we, if we have this collaborative approach. So it's quite a complex ecosystem that we're putting in place now to, to undertake our task, but that's really the only approach that, that we can take. And the final point that I make about the, the collaborative approach is uh, we are, as our name suggests, in, incredibly aligned and shamelessly adopting as much of the TCFD approach as we can. And the simple reason is because the market now understands that construct. And we don't want to be creating something that is new. And this has come, become very clear from our conversations with market participants. Please don't start from scratch. Um, and we're not, we're, not a, we're not creating standards. Uh, we, are, we are a framework that sits up, up on top of a number of different standards that are already out there. And many organizations have been doing work for decades on standards. So we're not in the business of creating new standards. <coughs> And we're very much going to be using the, the, the four core components of the TCF approach, TCFD approach as our, as our overall architecture for action. So um, let me just say a little bit more about uh, how we're configured. So uh, I've mentioned the task force. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the knowledge hub, which is our academic partner base for participation. There's another piece of the equation, which is we have something called the TNFD forum. and uh, in setting up the, the, the task force, we were overwhelmed with expressions of interest to join the task force. We, we could have been easily oversubscribed just with financial institutions from Europe and the US alone. But we set about building a task force that was globally representative. Um, but to capture that interest and to harness the knowledge that sits in all of the institutions that wanted to participate in this effort, we've created the TNFD forum. And that now has, in the, in the space of two months, we've now got over 200 organisations that are participating in the forum. Uh, academic institutions, governments, corporates, market intermediaries, etc. So um, we're really thrilled at the level of participation and the level of excitement that, that, uh, that we've managed to garner in a very short period of time. And the idea is that the forum is, is sort of our test bed. Uh, that's where we're going to go to roll out ideas and test uh, the framework that we're developing. And, and that's a final point that I make before I stop. Uh, in terms of the approach we're taking, we are, we are taking an open innovation approach to the, to the building of the framework. Uh, and this is perhaps a distinction and a difference from the TCFD approach. We are aiming to put something out into the market uh, in early 2022 as what we're calling a beta framework. And that is expressly designed to, to, to get something early into the market and benefit from market feedback. And it won't be a complete framework, it'll be an architecture. But we want to be very explicit in building in and capturing the learnings from feedback from market participants. So that's a different approach. It's a bit more like the way software is developed with putting out version one and then version two, version three. That's the approach we're taking. So um, it's, it's critical to have this collaboration. The forum will be our, our test bed and our partners for testing things and giving us that feedback. And uh, we've got a huge amount of interest in running testing and piloting on the framework going into 2022. So. So let me stop there. I'm very happy to answer any questions. But Tony, thanks very much. We'll just go. We'll just run through the panel, and then we'll have a little chat, and then we'll open it up to you. So think of questions you'd like to ask. So we, we're on a roll now up to mid 2023, when we hope to get the framework out out of that time for, for to be used universally, and it will have been tested and developed uh, then. So Christina, you're global communications manager of Greek Seafood, a big Norwegian seafood company. Tell us why you decided, or your company decided, to be a member of this task force and join the work. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, first, uh, let me just kind of give you very briefly uh, the context. So we are one of the global salmon producers uh, uh, in the world. So we're not doing uh, fishing boats. We are producing food. We are farming food in the ocean. So fishing would be the same as hunting, actually, food on land. Uh, but we are doing the same that the farmer is doing on land. So that's, that's kind of uh, very briefly the context. And obviously the, the concept of nature risk is new to us, but its essence has been really core to what we've done from, from the beginning. Um, and, um, uh, and just to give some example of that, so 
we are very we have strong dependencies on nature so for example um, we need clean water the right temperature the right salinity level the right oxygen level in our farm environment to farm and this is really really crucial in order to get good fish health and welfare for example on the other hand we can make an impact on nature and an impact on the environment where we operate and we have challenges to solve there uh, to reduce those impacts so really really core to our business strategy it's really about mitigation and solutions we think that seafood can be a part of the solution in the broader picture because the footprint from producing seafood is a lot smaller than producing on land with the global meat industry but we also have the challenges that we need to solve and this is where the TNFD really uh, plays an important role so because to solve these challenges to mitigate and to solve the challenges we need capital it's not uh, it's not going to be done overnight and it's not going to be done it's not going to be cheap because nobody has done these things before um, so so driving more capital towards the solutions in our industry and in other industry is really 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 key and that starts with the, with the framework that, that the, the TNFD is, gone, is going to uh, suggest. So for, just to give you an example of how it works today, so um, we as a company have uh, been uh, both reporting on our impacts and also our mitigation strategy for, for years. But I don't think it has been sufficiently understood by you guys in the financial industries necessarily, maybe because we didn't do a good enough job, but also I think because like every co corporation is doing it differently, right? And, and there are no standards and it's like, it's hard for you guys also to, to kind of understand what to look for. Uh, and we also have kind of the other side of the coin where, um, where we sometimes uh, see financial institutions that have these amazing Excel sheets and have made, made all these metrics and they think it, it works great. And then they try to kind of make us fit within their Excel sheet, right? Um, uh, so, and that's also like, not really always working, to be honest. Uh, so, so I think like to, to get that framework in place and, and to, to get those, these things standardized is gonna be really, really key to drive the capital towards the solution. So, so that's why we have joined and, and, um, and are taking part in, in the TNFD. Christina, thanks, thanks very much. So let's turn to Abid. Abid, you've been a champion on trying to bring sort of natural capital thinking into the financial sector, and particularly in Bank of America and before that, Merrill Lynch. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you think this is going to go from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Am I supposed to put this on? No? Mm, I think it's already no, on. fine. Yeah, so, okay, so perspective from Trelonia. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, so, Andrew, I would differ with um, your history of where things have gone, you know, what, what, what's made a difference, let's say, in the last few years. And I would add one more thing. It's, yes, of course, Paris. Yes, of course, TCFD and Mark Carney's effort, but also... ESG, and I know you don't like the term, but it really has made a difference in terms of, um, it, it's become a language, an essential language of communication between companies and investors. And this is, you know, the, the dialogue that we're beginning to improve, the dialogue that we, we, we're trying to figure out how, how to work, so that it works both for the companies who are trying to disclose, as well as the investors who are trying to figure out what's actually beneath the, the hood. Why is it so important? Well, it's because data are actually showing that if you are a high quintile ESG performing company, you overperform versus your, you know, the, the lower quintile performers, and it's it's measurable. Um, this is this is the significant difference. It, it, it used to be just a feeling, a hunch. Now it can be quantified. That quantification suggests it's around uh, three percent alpha, as we say, outperformance uh, for high performers. Um, and from the other perspective, from the perspective of the companies issuing the debt, so the, the cost of capital, it's roughly 200 basis points. So that gets the attention of your CFO. For that, sure. That gets the attention <laughs> of, um, you know, the, the, the whole array of in, in investors. Now the challenge is, the, the quantification is much easier in certain dimensions of ES and G, and climate is the obvious one. But even that, as everyone is, in this room will appreciate, it's all well and good talking about scope one and scope two, but scope three is all over the place. So it's, it's difficult too. But we know, it's blindingly obvious, that we have absolutely no sense of what the full array of nature-related risks are, how we quantify them, and uh, what, what the opportunity is. And actually what we really care about 
and I see Stephanie here at the back. You know, Stephanie will, will give you perspective from investors. What we really care about is how well our companies integrating consideration of all of the most material ESG risks and opportunities into their day-to-day -day business. So it's not a, you know, somebody in the corner who's responsible for churning out a glossy report, but it's actually mainstreaming it so that we can see it measured in the cash flows. That's where I think it's going, and that's where TNFD is going to be incredibly helpful because fundamentally it's about, there has to be a bit of simplification, right? It has to be a uniform standard framework so that it works for the vast majority of companies. If we can get down to a handful of core metrics and maybe some expanded metrics that work for perhaps specific sectors or spe specific geographies or certain supply chains where there are you know, everyone agrees that there are added stresses on, the, on, on, on deforestation risks, then I think we'll be making progress. And I hope that's where we are in, I hope not, it's not 2022, <laughs> isn't it? 2023, please give us one more 2023, year. 2023, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right okay. Abby, it's all right. I, I talked about the sprint, but we do have two years to develop the framework. Yeah, right, yeah. So. so that that's where I hope we're gonna end up. Okay, thank you. Well, um, Tony, just coming back to you, uh, often it, what comes up is in people's minds is, you know, we've got, already got TCFD, we're already doing our reporting there. Why do we need another framework? So can you just explain the interaction between the TCFD Between the two, yeah. yeah. It, so T, I think TCFD has, has obviously made a big impact and, um, uh, you know, I don't think it's been an easy journey uh, for, for either TCFD and coming up with the framework or indeed for many companies trying to apply the TCFD framework. but. But it's there now. There's a language system. There's a construct. It's being uh, mandated by by governments around the world. So there's a pathway to to that, that that's there. That's now familiar. People can see how we go from quantifying these issues, uh, getting to the right metrics, putting into a construct and a framework with the right standards, and then it getting into a into a disclosure framework, whether it's a annual report or something else. So we very much want to ride. In that, in that wake, if, if you like, follow the same sort of glide path. Um, we are starting as a voluntary initiative, but I think um, TCFD are very supportive of the fact that TNFD is now covering the other agenda, the non-atmospheric agenda, if you like. So I think we are very much uh, learning from their experience, trying to replicate it as much as we can. Um, but as you pointed out in your comments, Andrew, there's just a huge uh, scope of this broader environmental agenda that it doesn't capture, and that's what we what well, we have to start recognizing, quantifying, and and uh, and disclosing again. Mm. Well, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to dispense with our little chat we were going to have amongst ourselves. I'd love to get you guys involved in the audience. So let's just see what pops up, and then we can have our discussion as we go. So has anybody got a question that they would like to ask? Anybody get the ball rolling with a question? Yes, there's a gentleman at the back there. If we can get the microphone over, and let's have a few more. <clears throat> We've got about 10 minutes, I'd say. Well, brilliant, thank you. And um, just, I love the energy from all of you, so that, that's fantastic. Um, I'm Tony Bird, and I head up a campaign called Make My Money Matter. We're campaigning for people to have more voice and choice around how their money is saved and invested through their pension and banks. So I think this is fantastic because, you know, the progress made on TCFD will allow more disclosures and will ultimately allow pension savers to know the impact of, of their money. And now you're bringing in nature, so that's, that's really good. Do you think we're gonna move quickly to compulsory mandatory disclosure around mm. this? And, and where do you see that going? Thank you. Okay, question on that. Anybody else got a, another question? Uh, gentleman at the back, Tony. So one on regulation and mandatory, yep. Tony. Thanks very much, um, and, and thanks to the panel. Um, <clears throat> quick, quick questions, if you will. Just for so decades, for we were worried about financial positivity, returns, rewards, and we deluded ourselves because we forgot about the negative externalities. We're now talking about nature positive outcomes. Are we going to do partial accounting of nature? Do we understand its complexity enough, or we'll have proxy metrics so that we don't fall into the same trap? And what is TFND sensitizing yourselves, bulletproofing yourselves, so that we don't go down decades of deluding ourselves that it's nature positive? Well, let's just take those two. There were two quite meaty questions there. So let's, uh, who wants to pick up regulation? Uh, I'm Tony, you're going to do Tony one. and regulation. We'll ask you to, give to the harder comment question on to the harder questions <laughs> to them. Tony, regulation. So I, I think to your, to your point, um, 
Uh, first of all, congratulations on all the momentum you've built around Make My mm. Money Matter. I think it's an inspiration for how we communicate what we're trying to do and get ultimately citizens involved through their, through their pensions. So I would love to have that conversation with you offline. Um, look, I think the, uh, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a glide path now that people can see with the TCFD approach. Um, ultimately, we want to try and move uh, trillions uh, of capital, and so that's going to happen through regulation. But we are starting off as a voluntary market initiative. So I guess it, we'll see uh, uh, what the momentum is. But the good news is we're starting with strong endorsement from G7 and G20 ministers, from central banks through the NGFS initiative. So I think, uh, you know, back to my point about the fact that this is more a matter of when, not if, We've certainly got the attention of, of policymakers and regulators, and so I think that's a very strong foundation on which to start. But this has to be market-led. Um, I think that's very clear, and it's baked into our DNA, and the fact that the task force is all from the private sector. So we need time now to, to, to do the work, to try and figure out those difficult questions around how we're actually going to take something as complex as nature and boil it down into something that's practical and usable. That, that's the ultimate challenge, I think, of the task force. And we're going to have to make trade-offs. We won't be able to measure and monitor absolutely everything because it'll just be overwhelming. So uh, that's going to be our trick. But if we can get off to a good start, um, make something that tries to wrestle with that tension between scientifically driven and comprehensive and practical and usable at the other side, then hopefully the glide path to, to scalability is faster. We don't have 10 years to wait before this gets um, brought into more mainstream adoption. Can I just add one more thing? Because like you started your, your presentation talking about communication. Yeah. So great if you could get some people to help you communicate to translate what you're doing into one and a half degrees, you know, into those kind of things that help. Yep. Make. Absolutely right. Yeah. And we need to find that that architecture. We don't have nice targets and net zero, but we're thinking about how do we co-opt the language, if you like, where it's where it makes sense. Uh, so that we can have that kind of construct because that's what gets the pickup and, the, and the builds the momentum. Okay, well, let's just, just deal with that. It was Abbott actually that mentioned the word materiality mm. or material. Yeah. And, and this is always an interesting thing because we kind of live in a world of uh, uh, private profits and public losses. Yeah. And a lot of the losses are, uh, in the finance are, oh, nature's non-material. What that basically means is you can you know, trash a rainforest to make some palm oil. It doesn't appear in the share price of the palm oil company or in the palm oil. So... Uh, I mean, could you just take take us through that a bit? Uh, what are we? How are we going to deal with that? And and also, um, in the case of seafood, there's similar sort of things. So we'll come to Abbott first, yeah. and then we'll come to you. Yeah, sure. And look, I, I'm not going to um, give you my view of where I think the, the two years worth of work is uh, is going to is going to end up. But I, I have a hunch, and the hunch is based on the fact that um, you know there are lots of people who've been thinking about nature-related risks and. You see it within each of the various standard bodies. And you, some of you may have noticed yesterday a really important piece of news, which was the launch of something called the International Sustainability Standards Board, right? which is, which is important. I mean, it sounds like it's minutia, but it's important because it's actually recognizing that we can't have you know, six or seven different efforts. Now, when you look at um, the, the work done to date to identify which of these various previous bodies have come up with metrics that relate to nature, there's a couple that stand out. And one is linked to nature loss. Um, and the other one is uh, fresh wa freshwater availability. So on, on, on nature loss, you know, the, the metric is, is something around um, you know, land use and ecological sensitivity. Uh, on on uh, water availability, it, it comes down to um, you know, w w water consumed in high stress areas. I mean, I don't have all the details in front of me in terms of the specifics of the, the KPI. But you can get pretty granular quite quickly by focusing on some specific metrics and then taking it another level, um, you know, depending on the sector that you're in. So it's going to be different if you're in, you know, in the palm oil sector compared to if you're your company. And maybe that's a good segue to... Yeah, because I think this is really kind of at the core of, of uh, the work of the TNFC. So what level do we go to, right? Yeah. And, and kind of, and I think in terms of avoiding greenwashing, it's really important to understand each sector and, and have really good metrics that are forcing you to like, to show the real stuff, so to speak. And you can't kind of uh, put a lot, put, so it's not enough to have a lot of nice drawings around, uh, around the way we want to go, but it's actually asking for the right metrics to disclose, right? 
And I think that is going to be like, um, I guess, like a balance. So, so every sector is so different. If you go into our sector, you know, we have very specific metrics on survival, on you know, impact on wild salmon, all of these things, right? So, so we have to find a way to, to balance that, to, to have a, a framework that's, that's broad, that's usable for everyone, but to be more sector specific. And I'm just guessing that we will have to, we will start somewhere and it's not going to be the end, right? In like 2023. So, and that these things will come more sector specific, just precisely to, to kind of actually get the real risks and opportunities out there. Yeah, and just one additional thought, which is, you know, what, one of the, the wonderful parts of, um, you know, the financial system that we've been able to, that, that's, that's been really positive in the last couple of years, has been the growth of sustainable finance. So the idea is that once you have all of these ESG metrics being reported, you can then help companies by linking their finance to sustainability metrics. And there's, you know, just this year alone, we've already seen $3 trillion in loans and bonds with a sustainability linkage. You know, where there's, there's an alignment. So you know, the, the bank wins because it sees the risks being reduced from its, from, its, uh, you know, from its counterparty, or the investors win because the coupon is aligned to sustainable performance. So once we have metrics that are nature-related, whatever they may be, we can then begin to see those metrics getting incorporated into bonds, loans, trade finance, supply chain finance, and that'll be a win-win for, for both the companies and, and the markets. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, the timekeepers, do we have time for two more questions, or should we just wrap now? Because I'm... No, we can? We can't. We cannot. No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, thanks. I'm sorry it's so, you know, a bit rushed, but things uh, took a little longer at, to, at the beginning. Uh, please thank our panellists very much for, for their comments. And that's... Uh, we need that. Thank you very much.